to the webinar for vision from any. Uh, we're calling it immigration, money making sense, and uh, we're really excited to get started. Uh, my name is Lydia Seller, and I am the marketing manager here. Um, I'll be introducing the JV and uh, our series. Uh, so JV, uh, James Brewer, is our uh, financial advisor and planner of the Vision Law. He has been um, featured on Forbes and Oxford University Press, as well as um, several books because of his vast knowledge in the world of finance and investing. So today we're really excited to have him speak and um, we'll be featuring other experts in the field throughout this series. Um, he, these are all of the different uh, certificates and education he has, uh, just so that you know that you are in good hands with those material. Well, um, we are featured in 19 different states here in the U.S., um, and we hope to hear you and see your participation throughout those areas. Uh, Envision Wealth is here for the, for anyone of any age demographic, of any financial situation, and we are happy to have you. And I hope if you're live or on the recording. Um, but this is information that you'd love to hear. Here's Jamie. All right. Well, welcome. This is the first in the series. Um, today, we're going to focus on what's known as solo 401k, sometimes called owner only uh, 401k plan in the next. Uh, one, we're going to actually talk about the uh, larger plan, still small, but more than just the owner. And well, it could be your spouse as well, but it's an owner only uh, plan. Well, I got to make the attorneys happy because, well, you know, in case I say something wrong, so they like for me to say all written content and what I say verbally is for informational purposes only. It's not intended to provide any financial tax or legal advice or provide the basis for any financial decisions. The information contained in this presentation has been provided in sources believed to be reliable, but is not guaranteed as to the accuracy and completeness and does not purport to be a complete analysis of the material discussed. Okay, now that I've made them happy, um, can I ask you a few questions to start? Well, I have some questions we're going to answer later on. The good savings plan allows for tax free access before retirement. Which one allows for savings as an employee as opposed to an employer? Which one allows for the most savings overall? And last, which one allows for the most catch up? Not paying the CHP, but catch up because sometimes we get behind and we need to save more money. So there's a catch up contribution. Um, but well, we'll talk about that. So, which one allows for the most? So, in the next few slides for the rest of the presentation, we're going to run you through uh, many things that have to do with uh, thinking about your financial freedom and how you can apply being a business owner to select the plan that's right for you. So as a self-employed person, you actually have several considerations. So the first, of course, is when you have a business. So you're trying to run the business. So often running the business creates some challenges regarding cash flow. You might have Bills to pay, you may be, uh, you know, what space expansive, so pretty good one. Um, you know, all lots of things that are on your mind. So you got to think of all that stuff. But then it's also your personal, because the personal, in most cases, as a solo business owner, kind of bleeds in. And now you have the bleeding of the plan that goes along with your business. 
So what do you need to, you know, eat at home? And well, maybe you've got a spouse and they've got demands on what they need for cash. And maybe you've got children. Let's just get real about you know, living. And then somewhere along the way, there's this thing called retirement. But I think if you really kind of think about financial freedom as opposed to retirement, financial freedom, like at what point in the future can you live comfortably for the rest of your life without needing to work? As opposed to thinking of some, you know, some person who made up a date on when it's supposed to be retirement. So I was listening to something today and someone said, I need to retire at 45. Well, good for them um, if they have thought through living to 100. My mom's 94, so I can't relate to potentially that I'm going to live a long life. She didn't think she'd make it out of her 80s. Um, and she has already. And, well, I take more medicines every day than she does, so who knows what's going to happen to me. Then there's taxes and saving today. So I like to think of saving today. So, well, maybe you got some tight things going on with the cash flow. So maybe you can't save as much as you might think that you should save, but we actually want to calculate what the savings should be. So if you can't save today, then you apparently got to save tomorrow. So if you're going to save tomorrow, how much should you save tomorrow? And well, you're setting yourself up to be able to save that. Because, well, if you don't think about it in the future, you might not be able to take them all in the same thing. And then there's the conversation to me around taxes. Taxes. Um, do you remember why it's a chance to pay to get taxes versus taxes? I don't know why I thought that, but I'm not on vacation. I went on vacation to Texas. I was probably going to say about that, but we're talking about taxes here. So, so what about taxes? Most people focus on saving taxes today. But I believe you should think about saving taxes in your entire lifetime. So if you actually have certain plan features, you might be able to save on taxes today or pay some taxes today in order to save for in the future. So those are some of the planning considerations that you should have in your mind. So as we think about uh, saving, and the choices that an employee her has. Because you might not think of yourself as an employer only, but you are. And in this world, your ex can be an employee, and you pay yourself. So think of yourself as an employee. So on the first point, we have the simple IRA. The simple IRA, did anyone know? Because I got to write this down, I can't remember everything. Then the simple plan stands for Savings Incentive Match Plan for employees. You know, some of them are really hard for government to come in with all those employees. <laughs> so, uh, but so for this case means that if you had one of those, you could say 15500 And then there's that catch up. And notice that catch up always seems to be when people get 50. Um, I have 50, so I don't usually catch up. Um, so then you could add another $3,500, another $3,500. Um, so we'll put that's 19,000. And then there are two other plans. There's the SEP IRA, and then you see this thing called elective deferrals. So let's say, what is a SEP plan? Now, this one's also interesting. It says simplified employee pension. Simplified employee pension. Now, every day, or well, at least once a week, someone says, I don't have a pension. I go, do you have a SEP plan? Well, yeah. But they don't call it a pension. But so many government said it was a pension. Interesting. So notice that with the pension, you now see a contribution limit, or in this case, it's still an IRA, but notice that it's an IRA. Then it says $66,000. $66,000. So then let's come down to all the way to the bottom first in what we call defined contribution plan. So defined contribution plan. There's something called a risk. It's not the twin of ERISA, it's ERISA, but in this case, ERISA stands for the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, which I always say, do you have retirement income security? You're supposed to have that inside of your ERISA plan. So there, the limit per participant, per participant is $66,000. 
Well, there's this little wrinkle called the 401k, 403b, 457 plan. What's interesting about that, it says elective deferrals, let's call it savings. You get to save as the employee $22,500 this year. Every year they seem to be uh, incremented up with a catch up contribution of $7,500. That's a lot more than $3,500. And oh, yeah, by the way, there's an IRA. People call it that. The IRA only has $1,000 worth of catch up. In fact, if you actually had both the Roth IRA, IRA plus the catch up is is the uh, plus the one thousand dollar catch up for it. It's the seventy five hundred. So you're actually getting more juice out of this. But the cool thing about it is you as the employee get to determine how much you want to save. It's not left up to the boss, but now you're the boss because you're the owner, right? But it's the employee contribution. So let's move on. So I'm going to try to explain the contribution that the bit man. So here we're going to forget about this, but we'll really talk about the seven and the four when we get So notice that it both starts with the sixty-six thousand dollars, but you can put away three two thousand five hundred yourself for the second column in column D that says that if you subtract the B or C from B. Then that is what you as an employer employer could add to it to get to the $66,000. This is important because there is that 25% match. You want to see it on the other slide, but it's subject to a 25% total compensation. But the part that might not be so clear is well, the 22.5 isn't part of. That sixty-six thousand dollars calculation. So you could make you have to pay a little bit of like five percent extra. You could make let's say um, up to twenty-four thousand dollars and be able to put away twenty-two thousand five hundred. And if you did it simply as a what often is referred to a traditional or a pre-tax savings, you just suddenly made the money this year. Now. You've got the 174, so you kind of see what the income to max it is. So you know, check out some stats here. The name most people want to make 174, just let you know this is how it works. Now, if you are over 50, you've got the catch up of 7,500. $30,000. Make about 32, 33, somewhere there. Let's get rid of that. Put away $30,000. Seventy-three thousand five hundred. So when I talk in the first slide about, you know, hey, don't have the cash flow today, but if you think about it in the future, I got some cash. Say seventy-three five. Now you're missing out on the compounding, and that's for another presentation. But that's why you need big chunks of money to throw that in there to actually catch up. But I don't like it just for the same. There's other stuff. There's other stuff. So the first that I love is the loan feature. Loan feature. So a lot of people find themselves a little tied on cash. Tied on cash. And you know, unfortunately, they sometimes talk to me and it's too late. And they say, JB, things got tough. So I had to take a withdrawal from my 401k. Now, if they're a business owner, I really shudder. Okay. And if they were actually an employee of a firm, I would have asked them, did you check to see if you have a loan feature as part of your plan? Because if you do, you could take a loan up to $50,000. So technically, it is 50% of the balance up to a cap. Of fifty thousand dollars, so hundred thousand dollars. Now you can get fifty. You got forty. You get twenty. So now you see how that works. But if you take the withdrawal, and many people do, you immediately have to pay taxes. And if you're under fifty nine and a half, you have to pay a ten percent penalty. So you're not really getting all the money that you possibly could. So alone, 
is a much better deal if you have that option. And then there's the raw feature. So there's pre tax or the traditional savings, and then there's post tax, or we call it raw. Now, um, there's a few people here. I'm looking for not. Does anybody call their checking account their post tax account? <laughs> I have never met you. I'm looking like confused. Like, are you kidding me now? If I check it again, you call your savings account your post tax savings account. No, we call it our savings account, right? So just think about it. Like, your saving money or the money that has arrived in your checking account, it simply came from what has already gotten taxed. So most people are looking at it. Oh my God, it's so big. The law gave that big tax. I'm not sure. No, like that's just what we're used to. And really, there's some machinations that go uh, with that. And oh, by the way, you don't avoid taxes on the other side. You, whenever you take a withdrawal later on, you end up having to pay the tax. So just keep that in mind. But I love the Roth feature because people who know the safety, you're like Mr. Roth. I know because I really like, you know, I like the number zero. Like down the road, I pull the money out at zero. I don't have to worry about what the tax rate is. But there's a phase out, so I just want to make sure I'm reading it correctly. Um, so if you're single, so for all the single ladies, all the single ladies, okay, so um, that is $138,000. And they're single guys too, sorry, I guess. So then maybe there's no song for you. Yeah. Um, okay. so, so the song says, so we have $138,000. So if you are under $138,000, you can take a full contribution. Once you get actually over 153,000, and good for you because you're really high income now. And once you're over 153,000, you can't do a Roth IRA. This is Roth IRA. And but if you're married and you're filing jointly, you don't get don't be married and file separate like this. Mm -hmm. You can't basically do it. Mm -hmm. But if you're married filing jointly, um, the max is 218. So under 218, you can take a complete. Uh, so both of you. By the way, both of you can both save the full 65 or 7,500 if you're over 50. At 228, you are paid tax. At 228, you are paid out. If you have this owner only 401k, you get to add a spouse as long as they're working in the business. So you got to pay them. You just can't go, hey, honey, here's some money. Here's some money. No, you have to have them all the payroll in the business. But we're going to see some wonderful ways why that might be a really good idea. Or you might even decide that some of the income you were making, you want to shift to that person. Um, if you look at this, and then there's the ERISA plan, Employee Retirement Income Security Act. It has unlimited creditor protection. Unlimited creditor protection. Does anyone remember the name O.J. Simpson? Yes. Oh, we got shopping. Okay. Let's you know, he was a wonderful football player, but let's do <laughs> some other stuff. That yeah. in, uh, but, but, but when in the civil suits, uh -huh. in the civil suit, yeah. he didn't pay any money. Yeah. And people realize that. This. Okay, you heard it here. So you keep that in mind for your future. I'm not saying go and do any uh, illegal activities or questionable activities, but I'm just, okay. So now, you can leverage it to save taxes. Right. Well, if you save on the traditional side, you can reduce your taxable income for today by saving on the traditional side. And you can leverage that on both the employee side, which will, or the employer, so depending upon uh, how you're filing your taxes, you have uh, opportunities on both sides. So we're going to give you some practical examples. Um, sorry if the slide's kind of busy, but there's a lot going on. So first of all, we've got the phase outs up here. I think I might have put the, what the numbers. It says 124. Oh, it should be 138. I had a previous one that I didn't say. So remember what I said before. It's really 138 and 218. They're always changing, and sometimes I forget to go change the slide. So it's 138 for the single ladies. And 218 for uh, the mirror. Okay, so um, now it could be wise to save in the 401k to reduce your modified adjusted gross income 
Um, magi, you know, for the Christians, it's not that kind of magi. <laughs> the Bible does grow some um, So, so if you consider that in a way to get your income underneath that amount, the complete to me really big deal for uh, Mary because potentially it's two seventy five hundred mm -hmm. that now you're availing yourself to. And now, as I'm going to try to explain those restrictions that kick in that 25% um, you know, income piece on the employer side, you may be able to avoid that by simply getting yourself involved. Um, and I remember my next slide and what it was going to say that I could even read a load in my bank. Oh, Rebecca. Uh, and she's got some cash flow and she really would like to save more money. I said, great, Rebecca, that's beautiful. And um, she says, you know, I'd really rather pay the taxes today and not even deal with that stuff. Mm -hmm. So set up a Roth 401k. Now they can, or she can do the $30,000 by being a little bit to get her income under the phase out. Now there's another $7,500. And she still can make the employer contribution subject to the income limit. So now we're getting her underneath the income limit. So 174 was what was required, right? To do the math. But in this wrinkle, whatever she saves in the employer side, so I keep saying her versus in the employer side, there's something called a Roth conversion. So down the road, she can actually convert those employer contributions into Roth. So now she'll have all the money involved, which is ultimately what she would have. So we've got four examples that I'm But we're going to see how they kind of progress and work together. So, in our first case, we have uh, a uh, married couple, both under 50. Well, a little cash flow crunch, a little cash flow crunch. So, what? Should the owner do? Well, they had some money at a former employer's 401k. I've had a few cases where, you know, there were two or three. I think we had one might be the worst, like seven different accounts in a bunch of different places, former employers, could be 401ks, could be IRAs, symbols, SEPs, all over the place. Well, by rolling those monies, rolling those monies, you might call it transfer into their own setup solo 401k, now they can take a loan of $20,000. And remember, we can make it up to 50, but this is practical case okay, setup. So there was only 40,000 um, available. Don't forget, you gotta pay the loan back. Mm -hmm. So, but, you know. okay, so here's our example number two. Um, over 50 couple earning 174. In this case, the owner decided, hey, let me put the spouse on for $32,000. Um, remember, the employer contributions are limited to 25% of the income, which gives us a $51,500. So the owner decides, yeah, I think I'm going to do $22,500 in traditional, bring my income down a little bit, or that's just what they thought. Some people ask, hey, maybe I'll do the $7,500 in the uh, raw catch up. Um, so the owner and the employer, not employee, the owner's employer can get 43.5. So we're subtracting 23.5 from the 66,000. Only the 22.5 counts, the catch up does not count against this. And then the spouse says, you know what? Uh, one day, well, let's say, ladies, it's the, it's, you're married to a guy, and well, it's probably going to die before you do. So you're like, look, I don't want to pay your taxes. So I'm going to do mine abroad. My wife's 10 years uh, younger than me, so it's probably highly unlikely. Um, so so $30,000 abroad. Um, so then the spouse has an available uh, contribution to receive of $7,500. So that's how we got that. Notice how everyone can. <laughs> As they listen to my presentation and they learned all the ways that they could 
give it a hundred k, a hundred k, and not the thirty-two k. So the back set looks a lot the same. Um, so the owner is going to do the twenty-two five and the seventy-five hundred, and then they can just set that up if they want. Um, and I'm only just highlighting the catch up. It doesn't have to be seen as catch up in the raw, in this kind of initial model. Um, and then they were getting 435 again, but in this case, the spouse actually gets a 22,500 contribution. Oh, more happy people. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this time, this was, I think, my real favorite. So this spouse is doing so well that they're getting some income from another company and they're working in the business. Here are many people like you know they they took their money from a couple of different places. Okay, so uh, they've got access to a four hundred one k. Sometimes people don't have access to a four hundred one k. That creates a wrinkle, but in this case, they do have access uh, to a four hundred one k. So we've been talking about this twenty two thousand five hundred. The twenty two thousand five hundred is a limit to you as the employee. You can say the case as an individual. You don't get uh, 22 5 with every employer, you get 122 5. Mm -hmm. 122 5. So you could split those amongst employers, but that's a headache, right? That's a real headache. So in this case, the spouse chooses their outside plan because they're getting a 50% match. Yeah. The spouse didn't give it up a match. I don't know how to take that. Yeah. The matching bonus, Chevy sure look, looks good. Um, most of the other facts look the same as we've been looking at so far. Um, they, this time, because they made more money, they got a little bit more money in terms of the extra contribution from the employer. Hopefully that may this is making sense, making sense. Okay. So now I'm going to ask questions, at least for people who are here. Uh, and they can actually you know answer online too and you know see what's going on. So which savings plan allows for tax-free access for retirement? The choices will be simple, set or 401k. Simple set or 401k. <laughs> Isn't it wrong? wrong? Well, you can you can make it the whole thing be wrong four hundred one k, but it's got to include four hundred one k. Yeah. So I was trying to simplify. So technically, you know, but I was trying to be so technical. A four a wrong four hundred one k is really a four hundred one k plan. That has a Roth feature. Okay. I don't like the rules. I just try to interpret them and explain them in a way that you can digest them. Mm -hmm. So the answer is tax free. You can take a loan on the borrowing. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if it's you have it in Roth savings or if you have it in traditional. Okay. Which one allows for savings as an employee? An employee. It's got limited to 22.5 employee. Yes, there we go. It's the 401k. You're going to figure out that there's <laughs> a pattern. There's a pattern. Which one allows for the most savings overall? Are like, yeah, yes, good yeah. answer. Which one allows for the mint? Not the red stuff, but the ketchup. The ketchup. Yeah. 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 Which one allows for the most ketchup? Are like, <laughs> Progress today. In doubt, say 401k. All right, good. All right. Uh, I'm glad that we've got people that are uh, very awake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so I think I've thrown a lot of information at you. So the idea is that you're walking away with some things that you can actually uh, take action on. So a little bit about um, our firm and how we work. Uh, you can check out the website if you want, or this is what I'm about to tell you. So far today, we've been focusing really on what is number three in this financial uh, needs pyramid, and it's the savings 
Mm. It's the saving side of things. We haven't really talked about how much you need to save, but we've been telling you about when it comes to retirement, what are the sizes of savings opportunities between simple, set, and poor one? And that's really what we've been focusing on. But you couldn't have a pyramid that stood if you went to the building. You have to start from the bottom to build, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so on the bottom here, I'm talking about things like you have an emergency fund. Yeah. What happens if you're disabled and you can't work? Where's the income coming from? Mm -hmm. What happens if you're married, have children, or maybe you're single, have a child, and you pass on prematurely? Mm -hmm. How will there be income flowing to take care of uh, family? Mm -hmm. And if you're single, because a big thing that I have is, well, even if you have disability, what about estate planning and often or legacy planning? Some people think, oh my gosh, it's not for me because I'm young. But well, what happens if something happens to you? Who's going to make decisions for you financially? Who's going to make decisions regarding your health that may not be your own? So those are things that I put in brown color because to me, think about it being dirt and the rest, the yellow above is above the line. Then the yellow part is the cash flow. We've actually been talking about that since our very first slide. Business cash flow, personal cash flow, and things like credit score and how that affects your ability to access uh, money at the lowest possible rates because we'd rather you pay less than you pay more. And then those things that are supporting the savings side of things, or I should say you look to accumulate the right amount. So that's a little bit about our philosophies. So, but in an effort really to make greed really work, as you're pursuing your definition of financial freedom, do you actually know how much you need to save now? <laughs> and if you can't save now, do you know how much you need to save in the future? Help. Oh. Okay, well, help is all the way. <laughs> so um, we want to start with questions like, how much will you spend in retirement? So people ask me, oh, I don't know, can I, oh, I don't want to retire. I'm like, well, okay, if you make, say, 200000 you want to live on forty. I'd be able to do that pretty fast. But if you work, make forty, and you want to live on 200000 you might be delusional, but <laughs> that's a big chunk yeah. That's what I want. Yeah. And I go, but I'm, I can show you the math and how that's not going to work. But really, what we want to do is help you figure out what is realistic for you given your resources. But then there's questions what are basic living expenses that would be? Healthcare. Most people don't even realize that healthcare has been rising at like 5%, yeah. higher than uh, inflation. Yeah. So when people have been hitting up that system, yeah. uh, my son's been. To worry about four or five times this year, it's just been really crazy. Uh, so we got it mm -hmm. really then there's long-term care. A lot of people think long-term care is healthcare. No, it's actually a separate thing, and it's been going up by about five percent, which you're in all the time. It's not like you know, an on-occasion thing like healthcare, so it's quite expensive. You can't really uh take a run from assets, and then most of us have some wants and needs. I want to travel. Mm -hmm. You know, but do I want to, you know, travel in the hostel or do I want to travel, uh, you know, via the Ritz Carlton? I mean, it's different prices, so if you kind of calculate that in today, maybe you tweak your savings rate a little bit. So um, the four on the left, we're blowing it up here. So we have something that is a tool, and once you put your information in, we're able to actually kind of quickly assess given its accuracy. Assess well, how funded are you? I don't know if you ever listen on occasion. I was at VR, I'll talk about funded pensions. Funded pensions. Well, actually, what does that mean? Well, there's liabilities or, or how much it's going to have to pay. In this case, how much you're going to need on an annual basis. Well, how funded are you? In this case, this person is 65 percent funded. So we have the on the left hand side the resources that they have based upon what they said they wanted. That's the present value of what they're going to need, not all at once, but what they're going to need throughout the years of their retirement. And the top side is giving you some idea of the expected rate of return on what they're going to save over the time that they're going to save it. 
So to give you at least some idea of where you actually stand. So uh, kind of in summary, if you hit our QR code, um, that will actually take you to that uh, discovery assessment where you would put in the resources where we could run um, that particular uh, analysis for you. It does more than just that one. We look at things like um, you know, what would happen in a cash crunch, mm -hmm. um, what would uh, happen if the patient got disabled, those are just a couple of the ones that are quickly assessed. Um, we've had people either involved because they went online, but some people simply came here because they saw the nice signs out. Uh, so uh, you may want to get our uh, email list. So the email says send it to marketing at individualwealth.us uh, and we're going to leave the QR code up while we take some questions. Okay. All right. So we have questions online or questions in house. Yes. Are you are you able to access your four one plan if you have an app one player and you change to a different number? Does that four one plan be successful in this? Wow, that is such a foundational question. Thanks for getting us started. So your 401k is your prior employer. You have choices. You can choose to leave it at your employer as your prior employer. That has a wrinkle because if depending upon the size of the balance, your former employer may decide to go to a firm and essentially kick you out of the plan, but another firm creates an IRA. But it's not at your former employer, it's at the same place. If the size was, or they didn't have that feature in the plan, then yes, it still stays there. Now, there's all kinds of questions because to me, well, what is it investing? But even if your former employer, former employer, let's say today they have a Vanguard plan, they may switch to a fidelity plan or switch to a principal plan. I actually had an employee where that actually happened, like two or three plan changes down the road, their money was still there. So, how do you find the money? You could decide that you want to roll over your money from the old 401k to a to your new employer, or you may decide I want to roll it over into the IRA. So, you have several choices. There's lots of factors to consider in which one that you want to do. But if you can take out a no longer 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 if I remember the stats, only 50% of employers have a 401k. So you may move to a place that doesn't have a 401k. So, you know, each person's situation is. We have a uh, question online. It says, How does something like a 403b fit into this topic, or will that be answered in part two? Okay. So, 403b. Um, also has the deferral 22,500, 7,500. There's also another wrinkle that I've never seen anyone qualify for. So um, the ability, so, so really you're kind of capped there. Unless there's a 457 plan. So a 457 plan, if you qualify for the 457 plan at the nonprofit or government entity, then potentially you're able to save in the 457 and the 403B to further maximize your uh, savings. Okay. Uh, we have another one. Already retired and starting a business, not collecting social security, but looking to file. How do you handle not going over the allowed yearly amount and still pay yourself from the business? Uh, 
okay, I'm going to assume some things. So that wrinkle is where more custom planning is, is required. So um, if you're trying to pay yourself out of the business, then there are some social security uh, taxable issues, and it depends on the year that you took um, your social security. So there's kind of several things going on, so it's difficult for me to really give a complete answer, uh, but potentially that was one where at least on a part of that uh, tax piece. Mm -hmm. But if you do do a, uh, a solo 401k or something, um, then you're able to not pay yourself per se, save the money and wait till a future time. So I don't know completely how much money the person needs to get out of the job well, to live. Um, so if it's a combination of social security as well as the business, um, that potentially is going to kick in some extra taxes on the social security. Should I, I start contributing to the board? Should I invest in a 401k plan even if I'm just starting a business? Or should I wait until the business is more established and I know for sure that's not? Cash flow should always be a consideration. That said, you don't have to fund it every day. You have to have <laughs> a structure. That's what I like to call it. You have to have a structure. Mm. So you need the structure. So let's say you discover, like I do this so you discover at the at the end of the year, actually, no, let's just say that you, you have a plan that you establish in 2020. And uh, your accountant tells you in January, you made 15 grand. And you know, like, well, if you had a plan, mm -hmm. Then you can do the employer contribution subject to the 25% and all that. So you can save mm. money as long as you have the structure. Now, as an employer, you have the ability to uh, take all the way to the extension, which is somewhere around August and the to then actually add the money into the plan. Which you might even find that let's say that you get contracts and the contract is going to pay you in April of 2024. Well, you could use the contract money from 2024 to fund your retirement plan back to uh, tax year 2023. Yes. Why should you trust the vision? Why should you trust the vision? That's almost personal. Okay. So, um, one of the ways is that we are fiduciaries, meaning that we are required to act in your best interest. So, as a Series 66 uh, registered investment advisor, or investment advisor representative, um, that is a requirement. And additionally, I'm a certified financial planner, which actually has a higher standard than that baseline standard of working um, at all phases of your financial planning um, as a fiduciary. Uh, I'm also an accredited investment fiduciary. So I have several layers of fiduciary uh, depending if it's in the financial plan itself or if it's in the investing portion of it. Um, and I would hate to be on a witness stand when they would probably add my Forbes contributions, my uh, chapter and mm. financial behavior book, and all the other things that are out there in the public domain. And I would look to you. So. Mm. That's why I had to give you those legal disclaimers to start off with, mm. in case I say something wrong. <laughs> so, and then I just want to believe that I'm uh, a nice person and I care for my people. In fact, I use the term of lives under care, and then we care for you. You know, you're part of the uh, 
envision family. Um, and we don't believe in kicking people out of the you know, tough times. Mm -hmm. You know, tough times are kind of there. Yeah. yeah. What got you into the finance world? Like, what makes you so passionate about it? Jeez, he saw the world. Um, well, let's see. My kind of water story um, kind of goes back to um, in my undergrad, I was in finance and marketing management. Uh, uh, students, mm. um, I went to school for like, my grad school and thought I wanted to be in Wall Street. On Wall Street. Mm -hmm. I decided that that wasn't my vibe. So mm -hmm. I my people. Mm -hmm. um, then years later, uh, I got married and my wife and I met someone and we're looking for help. Mm -hmm. And But I told them that I didn't want to invest in companies that wouldn't hire me at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. MIT, MBA, um, that, that was just uh, difficult. So the person comes back and says, hey, here's a great portfolio for you, and you can give the money to charity. I'm like, what? Huh. Are you saying that I'm a charity? That was very hurtful, and I thought there had to be a better way. I met somebody else who said, hey, you know, you're pretty passionate about this. Have you ever thought about getting in the industry? So I decided to take the plunge and get in the industry because I felt that there was just a better way and that people should know that if you want to invest in women's empowerment and if you want to invest in racial equity advocacy and climate and all those types of things, that you could do so and still make money. And by the way, most of us never get any financial literacy education in here. Um, and often it's tied to buying somebody's product or investing in somebody's money. Mm -hmm. So a few years ago, I decided that I wanted to create a firm where people could access advice, advice by simply paying a subscription. So they didn't have to wait until you know they had two hundred fifty thousand dollars of investable assets and all the other things that a lot of the traditional firms do. Um, so I enjoy helping people and, and wanting to help them navigate the complexities of the financial system. And if you have student loan debt, like you know, you know, there's no investable assets to get paid from. And that's the reason that a lot of people aren't saving money. I happen to be a commerce funding and student loan advisor. We have especially software to help people with that issue. And also we have worked with people on divorce uh, financial issues. That's where people are separated as opposed to, you know, adding money. And that's a whole separate thing. So there's just a myriad of issues that ensnare a lot of people. And I just really wanted to help them. Thank you. Well, if there are no more questions, um, I want to thank you for attending. And hopefully we've made money. It makes some sense today. Woo! Woo!